Hello class, this is Professor Kamen, and this is your video presentation for joining processes, specifically welding. All right, let me go back to the first slide and we can go ahead and get started. Now, when we talk about the definition of welding, there are two types of welding. There's fusion welding and there's also solid state welding. We're gonna talk about both of those processes, but the first process we're gonna talk about is fusion welding. And fusion welding is defined by having two materials that are heated to their fusion temperature. So that's gonna be past the melting temperature so that they actually are joined together and become one piece and then are allowed to cool. Oftentimes during the fusion welding process, you'll have a filler, uh, filler material that goes in between the two types of metals that you're trying to weld together to help facilitate that joining process. So here's a diagram of just two base metals being, uh, I believe this is a butt joint being welded together. So here are the two welding uh, parts and then you're gonna have your filled up filler material that goes in between there. Now come and look down here, which is a small graph of your temperature. Farthest away your temperature is gonna be lower and then as it gets closer and closer to this welding zone, then the temperature, of course, is going to increase. So here's a here's a temperature at which the microstructure of your base material is going to be affected. So if you weld here, actually what happens is that the metal directly across or directly around the weld becomes a little bit weaker. And then the welding point is actually the strongest point of that metal, even sometimes stronger than the metal itself. Now, as you get closer and closer, you get here's the melting point of the material. Then you get to that fusion zone, that whirlpool, so where all these are going to be fused together. All right. In welding, you want to keep this welding zone as small as possible so that it doesn't affect as much metal around it and makes that metal weaker. So the more precise or the smaller your welding zone, the higher quality your weld is going to be. Now, the first different, the first type of fusion welding processes we're going to be talking about is electric arc welding and there are several arc welding processes. Electric arc welding is what you usually think about when you think about the welding process. It's one of the most common methods of joining metals and it's often used of course for steel structural fabrication for construction purposes. Here's a basic diagram of the electric arc welding process. What you do is you really create a circuit. So you have what's called an electrode and these electrodes come in different uh, types. Then after the electrode, you have a circuit that makes uh, that mates with the, the metal that you're gonna be welding together. And then you have a clamp here. So this clamp is actually representing the ground. And then that goes back to your welding machine. So your welding machine is creating the circuit. It goes all the way to the weld gun, which is sometimes a holder, sometimes a gun and then to electrode right here to your metal that you're going to be welding together and then back through to your uh, to your welding machine. Now, the way that this works is that, remember, you have to reach fusing temperatures, which are really, really high, so that this electric arc, which you can see right here, is caused because there's a circuit that's being created. And once this electrode backs off a little bit from this plate that you're going to be welding together, then the electricity actually arcs across, it jumps across the electrode to the plate because it wants to maintain that circuit. And that electric arc is extremely hot. And that's actually what's melting and causing you to reach those fusion temperatures and allowing the mechanism of, of welding to take place. All right. So we're gonna listen, we're gonna look at a video that talks about a little bit, that talks in a little more detail about the electric arc welding process. Shielded arc welding is usually accomplished by means of an electric arc formed between the work and the coated metallic electrode. Let's see what happens. When the arc is struck, it almost instantly creates a temperature of about 6,500 degrees Fahrenheit. 6,500 degrees Fahrenheit. The base metal and the metal in the electrode. The metal from the electrode is melted off in tiny droplets, is carried across the arc and mixed with the molten base metal. The force of the arc and the forward travel of the electrode causes the mixed molten metal to be pushed to the rear of the crater where it cools to form a beam. 
The movement of this metal toward the rear of the crater and the depth of the crater are an excellent check on the quality of the work. The operator should learn to use it as his guide. At the same time that the metal is melting, the coating on the electrode is being consumed. This takes place slower than the melting of the electrode, which shields the arc and helps direct the flow of metal. It also permits the use of higher currents, with the resultant faster deposit of weld metal. A gas is formed, covering the arc with a protective shield that prevents the exposure of the molten metal to the air, and therefore prevents the formation of harmful oxides and nitrides in the deposit. Also from the coating, chemicals acting as cleansing agents enter into the metal to help to remove the impurities. These chemicals with the impurities float to the top and cooling form a coating or slag over the bead. This slag causes the molten metal to cool more slowly and has an annealing effect. All right, so you are able to see the a little bit more close in picture of what actually happens during the electric arc welding process. Now there are many different types of electric arc welding processes and let's go ahead and talk about the different types that are most common and what really defines them between each other. The first is called shielded metal arc welding, SMAW, which is the official um, welding name but normally it's called stick welding. And the reason why it's called stick welding is because you're using a consumable electrode that looks like a stick. And I call it a consumable electrode because this electrode is actually used up in the process. It serves as the filling material of the weld also. So what happens is current is gonna flow from your power supply, that's from your welding machine, through the copper wire cable to the electrode holder. So you're gonna have a, a holder, not a weld gun, but a, an electrode holder. And then you stick that that stick, that electrode in there. And that's what's right here, okay? So the uh, electrode, of course, is clamped within the holder. And then on the electrode itself, you have a coating and then you have the metal inside. So here you have the coating, which is blue. And then you have the metal inside the electrode itself, which is inside the coating. Now, remember, the coating does several different things. It does more than just turn into a gas that shields the weld and protects it from oxygen and nitrogen, getting to it and forming these oxides and nitrides that you heard in the video that damaged the well, well also it serves to stabilize the arc and it serves as fluxing agent. So a fluxing agent allows uh, a much smoother flow. And when we're talking about flow, we're talking about that electrode uh, metal flowing into the weld itself. Now, um, the wire core, as I told you before, does act as a filler. And the way you start it off is the operator takes the uh takes the well takes the uh the, the electrode holder puts the electrode in the holder and then touches the electrode to the metal piece which starts off or completes the circuit then he backs off a little bit and allows that uh, arc to jump across to cause the weld let's look a little bit closer at this diagram so again this is shield metal arc welding also called stick welding but you have several things and i want you to pay attention to this diagram because in your final exam i'm going to be giving you diagrams and asking hey what kind of arc welding process is this or is this an arc welding process and so i want you to be, to be able to identify these processes based off of the diagram now i can identify that this is shield metal arc welding because it has a coating this is the only arc welding process in which you have a consumable electrode with a coating on it and you can see other things. You can know that here is gonna be your protective gas. And uh, of course, this leads out to your power supply. And then inside is gonna be your electrode. Now your ground is gonna be connected by a clamp and then going back to your welding machine. Let's look at some other videos that give us some more information about uh, the shielded metal arc welding process. From the Lincoln Financial Foundation. <laughs> Hi, my name is Brian, and I'm here today to show you the proper techniques of welding a single V groove weld using the shielded metal arc welding process. First, you'll need three pieces of material, two pieces of half inch, three by six, which are beveled each at 30 degrees. You'll need a backing strip, which needs to be a minimum of three sixteenths for the shielded metal arc welding process. You'll want to be sure that you grind off the mill scale on the front of the backing strip. 
on the front of each bevel, about an eighth of an inch, and on the back of each bevel, about an eighth of an inch. This is going to help your weld get better fusion and penetration. Next is time to tack the pieces together. I've brought some spacers, which will allow me to level out my pieces. We're going to be fitting this up with a quarter inch root opening. And I've got another spacer for that, which is a quarter inch thick. You want to center this the best you can on the backing strip because we're going to be using the beginning and the end of this backing strip, which is slightly. So you see, it. that's what the electro looks like. Now we'll start by putting a tack weld on each corner. The tack weld is just a little Next point go ahead of weld, well, just a point together. so that you can keep the I've pieces from moving around as you weld. Tack these pieces up because they tend to burn a little bit quicker and start a little bit easier. I want you to notice also that he has all of his personal protective equipment. He has his helmet, face shield, welding gloves, and also an apron on. So personal protective equipment is extremely important when you're talking about welding processes. There's a holder, there's a stick, touches it, and then backs away. And then these are remnants from the arc that's being uh, created. All right, um, I'm not going to look at that whole entire video. I'm also going to post this just the presentation, not just the video, so that you can look at that video in entirety if you want to. Let's keep going here. Oh, that's not the one I want to hold up. Come back. Okay. Now, here's another video of him continuing to do that welding process if you want to look a little bit closer. I'm going to go ahead to the next electric arc welding process, which is called gas metal arc welding, or also called metal inert gas or MIG welding. Now, MIG welding or gas metal arc welding is very similar to shielded metal arc welding, does have some improvements. And if you're thinking about uh, technical skill or technical difficulty, Gas metal arc welding is considered to be easier to get started doing welding processes. And so if you see somebody welding uh, in their backyard or welding at their house in their garage, most times it'll probably be a gas metal arc welding machine or they also call it a MIG, a MIG machine. Now, the reason why this has some improvements is that you have a constant uh, voltage supply, a wire feed unit. So instead of having to replace the electrodes that get consumed, this is also has a consumable electrode, but the consumable electrode is that wire, and that wire is constantly fed through the weld gun. And so you don't have to keep replacing that. Now, since that uh, wire is going to fill a material, it doesn't have a coating. And so you have this uh, gas, the shield gas. So that shield gas is responsible for uh, kind of creating a gas cloud around your uh, weld and protecting it just like that coating did as it turned to a gas for shield metal arc welding. And so this is piped in through a cylinder. So you buy the gas separately, you get a regulator, and it pipes, uh, pipes in through that weld gun. So again, it's wire is continuously fed, so that's beneficial. Also, you have the shield gas that uh, flows from a cylinder and then through the weld gun for you. So displacing air from the weld zone and then protect it. So this is an example of a welding machine by Miller. Miller is one of the popular uh, manufacturers of welding machines. And this is, of course, the MIG machine or um, <clears throat> gas metal arc welding. You have your weld gun right here, okay? And this little uh, loop of wire is for the continuously fed wire. This actually goes into your machine and then it's continuously fed up through this and then through your weld gun. Then, you, of course, you have this clamp, which serves as, as your ground to complete the circuit. And then you have your, your regulator here, which uh, regulates your shield gas, and then it pipes it up and through the wall gun as well. So well, here's another video that gives us more Hi. information My name is Steve Blyle, and I'm about the gas metal arc welding process. A welder. 
Wire feed, in one form or another, has become the standard of the welding industry. And with the development of less expensive welding machines, it's now common at all types of repair shops, on farms and ranches, and even in home shops. There are quite a few different manual and automatic wire feed processes. We'll be looking at gas metal arc welding, which is often referred to as MIG. This process uses a continuous solid wire along with an externally furnished shielding gas that protects the molten weld metal from coming in contact with the surrounding air. The weld puddle and weld buildup are very controllable and the finished weld bead is virtually slag free. This process was first used in industry around the mid 1940s to speed up the production welding of heavy aluminum plate. A solid metal wire was used with an inert shielding gas either argon or helium. This was referred to as MIG for metal inert gas. The characteristics of the inert shielding gases did not work well for welding on carbon steel, and this process did not become widespread until new wires were developed and used with either carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide argon blend. Because carbon dioxide is not an inert gas, the term MIG is technically incorrect. Everybody still uses it. MIG welding is a very familiar term, but the American Welding Society has designated this as the gas metal arc welding process to include all types of solid wire and shielding gases. Now, wire feed welding does have the reputation for being real easy. It might be a little more accurate to say that it's easy to get started. In any type of electric arc welding, the distance that the arc travels between the electrode and the metal called the arc gap, is extremely important. With wire feed, when the voltage and wire speed are set correctly, the welding machine automatically maintains a constant arc gap, even with slight variations in the position of the wire feed gun. You can make a weld the very first time you pull the trigger, but there's more to joining metal than just squirting weld. This is considered a manual wire feed process. Even though the welding equipment does maintain the arc, feed the wire, and supply the shielding gas, the welder still needs to control the position of the wire feed gun, the direction of the weld, and the speed of travel. There's also metal preparation and joint fit up. Some of this is technical information and some deals with welder skill. While there isn't anything that's especially difficult or complex, the more you learn both about the welding part of it and the technical aspects, the more efficient and effective you'll be. Whether you're headed into the welding industry or out into your garage. All right, so great information about the gas metal arc welding process. Let's continue on. Our next electric arc welding process is called gas tungsten arc welding, and that's GTAW or TIG, so it's also called tungsten inert gas for the same reasons as you heard before in the video. Now this is similar to MIG, except that you have a non-consumable tungsten electrode that's being used. So no wire feed, but a non-consumable tungsten electrode. That's why it's called gas tungsten arc welding. That means that your fill of material has to be fed externally by the welder, okay? So your fill of material is not uh, going to be melted within the gun or fed through within the gun, you're adding that film material uh, independently. And so that means that you're going to have to have utilize both your hands. You have one one hand on the welding gun and then one hand feeding that uh, film material. Now tungsten, uh, tungsten inert gas or gas tungsten arc welding is seen as one of the more difficult types between the three, a uh, shield metal arc welding, uh, shield metal arc welding, gas metal arc welding, and of course, gas tungsten arc welding. Tungsten arc welding is considered the most difficult, but it will also give you the more precise and the most, um, the more higher quality weld. Now here's, a, here's an example of somebody who's welding using gas tungsten arc welding. Obviously this is uh, kind of a setup for just to take the picture because you can definitely see some PPE that he's not wearing. But now you saw some of the other guys were wearing. Uh, he has a, a face mask and a shield, but he has no gloves. And it doesn't look like he has an apron either. So that, that's actually very dangerous if you were to actually be uh, welding, be gas tungsten arc welding. 
if we look at a diagram, there's definitely certain giveaways that can tell you, hey, this is gas tungsten arc welding. And the first one is, is that you're using a tungsten electrode. So anytime you see that you're using a tungsten electrode, it's the gas tungsten arc welding process. Now you always, you still have your shielding gas being pumped through the gun, okay? And everything else is, a, is essentially the same except for that part of it. And then here is gonna be your filler rod. So another giveaway is if you have your filler material being added separately, that's gonna be the gas tungsten arc welding process. As I mentioned to you before, it has a higher detail and gives you, I guess I have to minimize myself right here so you can see that we're superior quality welds. Okay, now this video is going to talk a little bit about the technical aspect of doing the gas tungsten arc welding process. We're not going to watch the whole thing again, but as I mentioned to you, to you before, I'm going to post this presentation on D2L so you can have access to the entire video if you want to see it. Hi, I'm John Swartz from Miller Electric. Throughout the course of a year, we get an opportunity to attend many events and shows and interact with our customers to talk about the TIG welding process. When we do, there tends to be a pretty common theme of questions that we get, so we wanted to take an opportunity today to go over some of the more common ones we get. So we're going to cover topics in today's video like what, what is the proper angle for holding your torch, um, how do you prepare your tungsten, and we're going to talk about some tips and techniques to help you improve your stainless steel TIG welding. So let's get started. The first topic we wanted to cover is proper torch angles. The first thing I usually tell people that have issues with uh, the TIG welding process at most of these shows is if you just keep three simple things in mind with the TIG process, it'll probably solve a good 80 to 90 percent of your application issues that come up. It really boils down to the angle of your torch, the angle of your filler material as you're adding it into your molten puddle, and just keeping in mind that the torch melts the base material and the molten base material melts your filler rod. To make things a little bit easier, here's a little snippet from the Diversion 165 and Diversion 180 DVD, maybe help clarify things a little bit more for you. Now I'm going to demonstrate the proper weld technique without initiating the arc, just to make it easier for you to see. Since I'm right-handed, I'm holding the torch in my right hand, and I'm going to work from right to left. If you're left-handed, do it. All right, so this video continues on to talk about, as I mentioned to you before, a lot of the technical aspects, which include the angle of what he calls the torch, which is the weld gun, and the angle of the filler material. He's also going to talk to you about the, the rate at which you move across uh, welding, your, welding your, your, your two materials. So... Again, this video has a little bit more to it, but you'll have access to it if you want to listen to the whole thing. We're going to go back to our presentation. Let's see. All right. So our next process is called submerged arc welding. In one of the videos, you mentioned how uh, the person who was speaking made a point of telling you whether a gas metal arc welding was an automated process or if it was an automated process, okay? So submerged arc welding is considered an automated welding process. All the other processes we talked to you about before are not considered automated. That's gonna be shield, shield metal arc welding, gas metal arc welding, and gas tungsten arc welding are not automated processes. But submerged arc welding is because everything you see is done by machine. Now, how does this process work? Well, the key difference about this process is that the welding takes place under a level of granulated fluxing agent. That just means it looks like a bunch of small granules or, or a large uh, or, or small pebbles. Okay. Now, what does this flux do? It, it does very similar, uh, the same, uh, <clears throat> it has the same job essentially as that coating did we were talking about shielded metal arc welding. It acts as a shielding agent. It helps to cleanse impurities. Now, in this case, it does slow down the cooling rate, prevent splatter, and that helps to give you a better weld. Like I said before, it results in a very good quality weld, but 
you are limited to flat or horizontal positions just because the flux can fall off if you try to do it to the side or if you try to do it upside down. And typically the applications are for welding pipes, large pipes or other structural items. I-beams would be a good example. Here's a diagram of the submerged arc welding process. Here's your grain laid flux. So you have some hopper dropping the flux in and then you have your, your welding process take place. So here's your wire electrode right here. It's welding underneath the flux, okay? So oftentimes you'll see people just kind of walk up. They don't need the, the big shield. They don't need the, the, um, the helmet. That's because everything's happening underneath the flux. And then in this particular diagram, you see a vacuum system recovering the flux. You really don't see that too much, but that's one of the setups that you can do, but you don't see it very often. Here's an example of a submerged arc welding machine. So here's your hopper, it's right here dropping down the flux and then just behind that is coming behind it and welding it, okay? And this is, you can see a large pipe and it's going around and welding the large pipe together. If I jump ahead a little bit, it'll show you the weld. So you see the pass beforehand and you see that groove there so it hasn't welded that part yet together. So let's jump a little bit ahead. ahead. And you can see that weld, okay? So it's gonna give you a very high quality weld. Right there, you can see that looks very, very good. Okay, and that's a submerged arc welding process. All right, now uh, another arc welding process is called plasma arc welding. And in plasma arc welding, you have heat created by an ionizing plasma gas, okay? Now, when that uh, plasma gas comes into contact with that electric arc, uh, it creates a very, very, very high temperature. So you can deliver temperatures of more than 40,000 degrees Fahrenheit to that weld zone. And it's also, um, has a very, very minimal effect on the surrounding welding area. So it has a very small weld, uh, weld zone. So out of all the arc welding processes, plasma arc welding will give you the highest quality weld. It is an automatic welding process. You can't do this by hand, okay? Here's a diagram of the plasma arc welding process. What tells you that it's plasma arc welding? Well, automatically, you know here that there's plasma, okay? So if there's plasma, it's plasma arc welding. Also here, you see that you have your shielding gas being pumped in, your orifice gas, that is your plasma gas right there. And then here's your, here's your electrode right here. In plasma arc welding, metal coalescence is produced by a constricted arc made up of a high velocity stream of ionized gas called a plasma. In most plasma arc welding operations, the plasma jet is generated by heating the orifice gas in the torch polenum chamber to a plasma and forcing the plasma to exit through a constricting nozzle or orifice. Partial shielding is obtained from the plasma and is supplemented by an auxiliary shielding gas. Auxiliary shielding gases used include argon, helium, or mixtures of argon with hydrogen or helium. Because of the constricted arc, the heat energy of the plasma stream is concentrated and extremely intense. This permits deep penetration, narrow welds, and rapid welding speeds with good arc stability. Work pieces can be joined with or without filler metal. Plasma arc welding can be used to join most ferrous and non-ferrous metals, including extremely thin materials such as foils. 
Plasma arc welding equipment cost is high, however, so the process is often limited in its application. All right, so another fusion welding process is called spot welding. This is very popular in the manufacturing industry, particularly in uh, car manufacturing and in other industries where you're dealing with a lot of sheet metal. So what happens is you have two electrodes and what they're gonna do is they're gonna join two pieces of sheet metal in a lap joint. That's where you have one metal uh, overlapping the other metal just a little bit. Now the heat needed for the welding process is caused when you run electrical current through those electrodes and what generates that heat is actually the resistance to that electrical current as it passes through the metals and the that resistance re reaches a height uh, where those two metals meet actually and then you can that uh, that friction that's called a resistance uh, creates enough heat to reach welding temperatures and then once that happens you have what's called a well nugget form and then pressure is applied to complete and uh, strengthen that weld and then the current is, turn, is turned off. So you're given currents of about 3,000 to even 40,000 amps and amps is a measure of current and it's again widely used for fabrication of sheet metal, sheet metal parts. So here you have a diagram of the spot welding process. Here are your two electrodes right here and then here are your two pieces of sheet metal in your lap joint. Now you can see here that your weld nugget actually starts from the inside and then goes out. And that's because the resistance is highest where these two pieces of metal uh, interface or touch each other. And a lesser amount of heat at the weld tip interface. Resistance welding is a process where metal parts are squeezed between two weld tips. Current flows between the weld tips and encounters resistance at the weld tip interface and at the part interface. Resistance to the current at the part interface creates enough heat to melt the metal and cause a weld nugget to form. When the weld gun closes, the weld tips contact the metal and squeeze them together. The metal is squeezed for a short time to make sure that the weld gun is fully closed and that the full weld tip force is achieved. This is referred to as squeeze time. A squeeze time of about 12 cycles is used for small weld guns, and 25 to 30 cycles are used for larger weld guns. When the squeeze time is complete, electric current begins to flow through the metal from one weld tip to the other. The duration of the current flow is referred to as weld time. The current generates a lot of heat when it encounters the resistance at the part interface and a lesser amount of heat at the weld tip interface. The heat at the weld tip interface is conducted away by the water-cooled weld tips while the part interface continues to get hotter and hotter. About halfway through the weld time, the metal at the part interface begins to melt then a weld nugget is formed. When the weld time is complete, the current stops flowing. Then a hold time of approximately four to five cycles is used to give the weld tips enough time to absorb heat from the outer perimeter of the weld nugget and cause it to harden before the weld tips open. A weld nugget should be as wide as the weld tip that contacts the thin metal and penetrates to between 20% and 80% of the metal thickness. This so there you are able to see and hear some of the technical details of how to of how that spot welding process creates a weld in those uh, two pieces of sheet metal. Now this is going to be the end of this video. I'm going to do another video which talks about the other type of welding process which is solid state welding.